I want to tell uh, there's a piece called On the Ethics of Writing About Others. Whenever I speak in public about autobiographical nonfiction or simply give a reading of my own work, I am invariably asked in the Q&A section, how should one deal with writing about one's family members or intimates? How does one balance the need to tell one's story with the pain others might feel in being exposed this way? The assumption is that since I have written candidly about family and friends in the past, I must know the answer to this difficult question. In fact, I don't have a one-size-fits-all answer or a single set of rules. I continue to find the matter perplexing. I have to keep making up my mind on a case-by-case -case basis, and sometimes I get it wrong. Let's first examine the common approaches to this dilemma. On the one hand, it is sometimes asserted that you have the right to tell your own story any way you want, and if you happen to offend some people by doing so, they are welcome to write their own stories. This strikes me as wishful thinking and irrationalization. We are always responsible for any pain our actions might give, and there is no get-out-of-jail card from some professional writer or teacher that will relieve you of that burden. That does not mean you shouldn't go ahead and write the possibly offending material. It simply means that if you do, be prepared to accept the guilt and don't try to weasel out of it by appealing to a FOIA license. <laughs> On the other hand, it is sometimes asserted, even by authorities as eminent as Joan Didion and Janet Markham, that writers are inherently betrayers who will backstab everyone around them for a good line. If you go to bed with dogs, you wake up with fleas, and if you hang around writers enough, you will be traduced. This viewpoint strikes me also as an exaggeration. In fact, writers may be no more given to betrayal than those in other professions, such as politicians, undertakers, high school principals, and florists. <laughs> I have certainly decided many times to hold back from using juicy material if I thought it would damage the reputation of the person in question or deeply offend him or her. Complicating the dilemma is that one does not always know what will cause offense. I have written fairly critically about people who seem to have no problem with it. I have written somewhat negatively about people who ignored the main substance of my critique, but pounced with outrage on some picking in detail they thought I got wrong. I have written glowingly about people who took it amiss because they did not like the idea of having a walk-on cameo in my center of the universe story when they considered themselves as the center of the universe, or simply because they did not like the presumption that I could take their measure in a few paragraphs regardless of how positively I ended up doing so. <laughs> so I have given offense, I have also given offense to certain people by not writing about them when I wrote critically about their colleagues. The issue at bottom is, who am I to judge anyone? A fair enough question. I am someone who calls himself a writer, and if I write about my life, I am inevitably writing about others because no man is an island. The main rules I give myself in doing so are, one, never write to settle scores, either enter into the other person's point of view and be as fair-minded as possible, two, try to write as beautifully as possible because well-worn prose invites its own forgiveness from you yourself, if not from the offended party. <laughs> when I first began writing about my family, I changed the names of my siblings but not my parents. Reasoning, I suppose, that my parents were elderly and their lives were nearly over, whereas my siblings were still in the midst of the struggle. My father, the scapegoat of my family, was pleased that I had written about him at all, even though the portrait was by no means entirely flattering. <coughs> my mother was touched that I had written about her as a young woman and said, Now I know that you love me. Typical of my mother, that she would have ever doubted it. <laughs> When a second memoir essay of mine appeared several years later, however, she was shocked and said it was all untrue. I asked her what I'd gotten wrong. She paused and said, there weren't lies exactly, but she was no longer like the young woman I portrayed. And why did I have to keep writing about that unhappy period, i.e. my childhood? <laughs> <laughs> she forbade me ever to write about her again. 
I refused, saying that by this time she was a lively character whom I could render easily on the page, and I would make no guarantees. She said she would still come to my book party but tell everyone I was her nephew, not her son. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, writing about one's family or intimates can be an aggressive, vindictive act, but it can also be a way of communicating something to loved ones you never could have before, a gift of the truth of your feelings. It can poison the air or clear it. In the end, my mother accepted what I had written about her, as did two of my siblings, but not the third, who still has not forgiven me after twenty years. And I didn't think I even treated her so shabbily on the page, nor did I use her real name. In retrospect, I can see that particular sibling relationship was due to crash and burn regardless. Some writers get around the problem by showing the manuscript to the person being written about and asking if he or she objects to anything. I understand the scrupulosity of this position, but I could never do it myself. Having made the decision to go ahead and write about someone, and having done it to my satisfaction, I don't want to give the person such power. Once you invite people to make changes on your unpublished manuscript, they will. Besides, it's my moral dilemma, not theirs. Giving them the option to revise would be like shifting the ethical burden onto them. Some creative writing professors advise their students that if the material seems too explosive, they should try writing it as fiction. I don't see this as a solution, since the person in question will most likely recognize the character based on him and still take offense. In short, the quandary remains obdurate. There are no easy answers. Here, however, is one little trick that works for me. I like to tell myself that I am not a nice guy. In doing so, I prepare myself in advance for the anger that may be directed against me and the guilt that I may have to endure for hurting someone else's feelings. The funny thing is that, by and large, I am a nice guy, but I need the fiction that I am not in order to sustain me in the act of writing. My final recommendations are three. One, befriend only people who are too poor to hire lawyers to sue you. <laughs> <laughs> Two, if you plan to write about friendship, make lots of friends, because you are bound to lose a few. Three, for the same reason, Try to come from a large family. <laughs> I'll read one more piece of this is uh, called uh, The Life of the Mind. It's in two parts. One, there's something about autumn that makes me want to rearrange my bookshelves, a soothing seasonal ritual like coughing pumpkins or burning piles of leaves. This fall, the impulse stole on me unexpectedly. I started to hunt for a book to read when I noticed my Japanese literature section was overflowing with excess paperbacks stacked horizontally above the tops of upright hardcovers and others in danger of slipping behind the front ranks and disappearing from sight. The Italian section, I noticed, had little extra room. I found I could consolidate the two, but what connection did Japanese and Italian literature have other than both countries having been Axis powers that fought against us in World War II? No, it would make more sense to move the Portuguese writers in with the Brazilians and, pa and pair the Japanese shells with the Chinese. Before I knew it, I was cradling armfuls of books like a wobbly accordion. I tried to keep them in the same order, but whenever a book or two fell from my hands, the whole alphabetical system was endangered, and I would end up having to file everyone separately which was what I secretly wanted to do, because it gave me the chance to handle each volume, to figure the covers, to browse a bit in the pages. Not so much the books I loved, as the ones I had neglected. At least one third of my books I haven't gotten around to reading yet. I stockpile books for a rainy day, but if it were to rain continuously from now until I am 90, I might still not be able to finish every title. I have the unfortunate habit of going on book buying binges and then forgetting what I had acquired. More than once I have picked up a classic, some Dickens say, which I haven't yet read, in a used bookstore or stoop sale on, on, my, on one of my walks, only to discover that I already owned a copy at home. These rearranging sessions serve to reacquaint me with my stock and revive the desire to tackle previously daunting titles. I set these aside in a separate pile, an ambitious stack of miscellaneous items like 
Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, Nabokov's Ada, and Perrin's Medieval Cities, books which I approach with an expectation more to better myself than to receive pleasure. I place them carefully on the end table beside my writing desk so that visitors may notice them and admire my intellectual. <laughs> In time, however, they become an invisible part of the furniture, and I return them to the bookcase, regretfully unread. But I am getting ahead of myself, back to the original organizing task. In a throwback to my childhood play with toy soldiers, I now control the movements of nations by dictatorially dispersing their literatures. Having rearranged the globe, hitched Spain to Greece, and returned India to England, I am ready to tackle subtle diasporas. My books are distributed not only by nationality, but by subject matter and genre, including categories such as movies, poetry, architecture, social science. Delicate decisions must be made. Once, to honor Freud's felicitous writing style, I paid him the compliment of putting him in German literature along with Wilke and Mann, rather than in the social sciences, where I had relegated such eminences as Max Weber. But then, I had never read much Max Weber, perhaps I was being unfair. So in the end, I moved Freud back in with a psychologist and sociologist. There are also certain sets, such as my complete Charles Lamb, that I want to feature because I like their bindings, or their tallness requires a higher shelf, or their authors are favorites of mine. This caprice has wreaked havoc with the alphabetical system. At times, I will take into consideration the writer's own feelings about whom he or she might wish to lie next to, and will match me placing Emily Dickinson at last beside Thomas Wentworth Higginson. <laughs> In other instances, I can be quite brutal about following a rigorous alphabetical schema deriving sadistic sport at the thought of forcing antagonists in life or aesthetic manner to rub covers together. <laughs> the main principle of organization, I am embarrassed to admit, comes down to snobbery. I promote certain writers on national cultures that fascinate me at the moment, or that seemed the gold standard of quality while demoting others to the remotest shelves. Chilius Siberia is a bookcase just outside my study in the hallway <laughs> next to the bathroom, which holds those contemporaries of mine, rivals who have somehow managed to win wide public approval. <laughs> Name names. <laughs> Curious, like everyone else, I had bought their books, read them with a mixture of disappointment and relief, and consign them to the nether regions. <laughs> the beauty of my system is that nobody coming into my house and glancing at its library would suspect how sensitively the ordering reflects my discriminations. They would see a somewhat random assortment of books, whereas I perceive the fanaticism, pettiness, malice, and good taste of the person who has put the collection together. <laughs>